Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, our second ISS webinar. Uh, this week, we're going to be focusing on um, specialists um, from international schools um, around the world um, to talk about some of the different issues that uh, um, our specialists have to address um, that are unique to specialists within education for an online learning environment. For those of you who aren't aware of international schools, um, international schools exist um started oh probably over over 60 years ago around the world and they have um expat kids and kids from all over the world um that all attend um english speaking schools and we have teachers from all over the world who also teach at them um one of the schools that i taught at we had 56 different countries represented and so you have such an array of students and it's really wonderful and the quality of um teachers that we teach with is pretty amazing as well so these teachers have all volunteered and stepped up to um help share some of the practices that they've been doing since they've been overseas because um a lot of them have been online for eight, nine, ten weeks. I work with ISS as the Director of Research and Development. Um, I'm also with uh, Laura Benson from ISS, who's in charge of curriculum for ISS and professional development. In the background is John Burns, who is our um, Chief Innovation Officer for ISS, who's handling all of our tech. But that's it. Um, it's really not about us. Um, we're just going to be helping to facilitate things and working in the background. It's really about um, the teachers who are always the rock stars. Um, so in alphabetical order, I'm going to introduce you to everybody real quick. Um, we have Nissa Brown, um, and she's an international music and arts education consultant um, coming to us from Amsterdam. Then we also have Carlos Galvez. Um, he's an elementary school PE teacher and he's from Saigon South International School in Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. Additionally, we have Ishi Gidwani and Ishi is um, uh, um, from, um, from Hong Kong International School and she's an upper primary PE teacher. And we have Stephanie Gravel, and she's coming to us, well, she's been teaching at, in um, China at ISB Bank, uh, Beijing. Uh, and currently, where are you, Stephanie? I am in Escanaba, Michigan right now. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And then we have Jules White, who is at the Carmel School in Hong Kong as well. And um, she's a PYP, MYP, and DP art educator, and she's been teaching online for eight weeks. So welcome everybody. We really appreciate you guys being vulnerable and helping us and helping us figure out how this goes. Um, the first part of this is we will address the overall themes of the questions that have come in. So when people registered for the call, we received uh, an abundance of questions. We broke them out into themes and we'll talk about those and ask them of our panelists. Then the second part is we'll open it up to Q&A from the audience and we'll go from there as well. Um, so to start things off today, um, question number one. Um, for specialists in an online learning environment, how might we best approach the assess assessment of learning? Um, Carlos, do you want to start us off with that question? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the first thing that I wanted to share is that um, we at Saigon South International School didn't really begin to have the conversation around assessment until around four or four and a half weeks. Um, we really focused those first couple of weeks on getting into routines, uh, figuring out what kind of programs would be most effective with students, um, and also really addressing the wellness issue, uh, mental wellness of students, the mental wellness of parents, and the mental wellness of teachers. Um, I think what, you know, we, we started off on a real high, and then as the news would come in, we kind of started going on a, a bit of a slump uh, and uh, motivation for teachers. Teachers got tired, and I'm sure everyone can agree here as I see everyone nodding. Um, and then uh, once we got out of that hump, or that slump, we all kind of got back, and that's when the conversations around assessment began. Um, for me as a PE teacher, I've, think, I've taken it all mostly on, I just want to make sure my kids are getting active they're active and they're, they're, they're getting out outside in their garden or wherever, you know, every, every country is going through different uh, rules right now. So um, my kids are doing a workout log and if they're submitting that workout log, I'm happy. 
Uh, at the same time, that's when I'm trying to teach them other things like dance and, and choreography. But for me right now, I can't put that pressure on the kids because I know that they're getting a thousand other things from other teachers. And there's so many things that we don't even know or are taking into consideration of what's happening in the home. So um, my advice is take it slow, especially if you're just getting started with uh, virtual school in your city. And so um, feel out your staff, feel out your family and feel out yourself and see where you go from there. Does anyone else want to chime in on that question? I would say it's, it's important also to just be really clear on what your schools or your district's expectations are, because to try to do something that's outside of them isn't outside of those expectations isn't going to serve you and it isn't going to serve your students. So if you need some clarity or you need some um, uh, specificity from your leaders, be sure to ask for that so you know what what uh, the expectations are. Is she good? Um, so for us, we, we really started off with, you know, realizing that we can't expect ourselves to be able to assess all standards and just having to look at which standards we could and just give ourselves that space to be like, you know what, it's okay if we can't get all of them, which ones can we get? Um, so really identifying that as well. I think that brings up an interesting point because I've heard so much about people who have moved towards standards based grading and reporting and when you figure out what those um, power standards are or what those big essential pieces are, it has helped with the online learning and for schools that haven't gone that way yet, that it's been a little bit more of a struggle and I'm wondering if anyone wants to touch on that. Stephanie, you had your hand raised. Did you want to Go ahead. Sure, and I can actually jump in on that question too. And I know as I'm a music teacher and one of the things that especially my instrumental colleagues have struggled with is what do we do for an authentic learning experience? And if you've adopted the NCAS standards, there are standards that are not just performance based or there are performance standards that aren't necessarily I'm sitting and playing my instrument based. So if you have those standards, it's easier to say, okay, you know what, for the first two weeks, we're just going to listen to music and talk about how it makes us feel, or we are going to create something instead, instead of, or plan a dream concert instead of saying, okay, the only thing we can do is what we have been doing in our school. Because a lot of the times the thing you've been doing in your school might not translate to this environment. Would it be helpful if we went around and said which standards our school is using? So Stephanie, which ones were you using? Uh, we use the National Core Art Standards. Okay. And Ishi? Uh, we use the Shape America Standards for PE. And Jules? Oh, you're muted. Okay. So we PYP. Uh, we are aligned with the IB. Okay. And Carlos, what are you guys using? Yeah, we use Shape America as well. Okay. And Ishi, you have experience with using all of them. Am I correct? the arts, the music and arts standards, I coach in many different uh, capacities, different standards, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Because I was in a webinar earlier this week and um, it was with a bunch of schools um, here in the States and someone said to me, they're like, oh, you're international schools, you guys don't use the same standards we do. I was like, oh no, yeah, we do. We use all the same ones. And we also use, you know, in other subjects, Common Core, we use, you know, um, NGSS, we use, we use all the same kinds of things that schools in the States would use. And that's helpful, I think, for some of our um, people who might be listening to hear that it's a, we have similar programs and a similar curriculum as well. Okay, um, I'm going to move us on to question number two. Um, for specialists in an online environment, how might we manage large cohorts of students and individual check-ins? We know with specialists, you know, you might have you have potentially far more than 20 students in a class at times. So how are you guys uh, managing that? Um, Ishi, would you like to start us off with that question? Yeah, so um, at the upper primary school at HKIS right now, we've just implemented something called Wonder Wednesdays, um, which we did our third one today. So we've only done it three times. And what we've done is we've, you know, brought the specialist department together. So art, music, and PE, we do it together. Um, it's just less overwhelming to do it as, you know, one person or one small department of music or art or PE. Um, taking on for us at 660 kids, right? So 
So for us, we've come together as a specials department. And what we've done is every Wednesday, well, first, you know, this came about because we just thought that kids have to get off their screens for a bit and they needed a break. So on Wednesdays, we thought, you know, the specials will take over 30 minutes per grade level. And so, you know, we come in and so we split it up per grade level. So we have at most 220 kids per grade level. And, you know, it, it does, as Dana would agree right now, you know, because you are, you're managing a lot of people on this Zoom chat, right? And it does, it takes multiple devices and multiple people, right? So you do, you do need to try and identify a team. For us, you know, we're really lucky. Our admin team have worked with us and helped plan with us. Um, and so, you know, we've got one of our APs on one computer admitting students in the whole time. And then, you know, another one of our APs is, you know, spotlighting or sharing screen, but we, we get them in on the planning process. So they know exactly what's happening and it's smooth running. So 30 minutes, you know, split between art, music, PE. And so we literally take about 10 minutes each um, and we all get in on the activities. So, you know, PE will take part in the art activities um, and the music activities and art will take part in the PE activities. You know, I mean, they hated doing the push-ups in front of kids, but you know, whatever, it was fun and the kids love it. Um, you know, what we found with, with managing the big numbers is, um, you know, the first, the first time it was new for us, right? We didn't do it. So the first time we would spotlight just the teachers that were talking. Um, oh, and it also really helps to have a big screen that you can airplay or put your screen on so that you can see the kids and you can actually call the kids out, um, you know, and say, hey, well done, John, you know, great push-ups, man, or that's a really cool, um, really creative piece of art there, you know, Maya or whatever. Um, they love it. They love it when, they, when you call their names, right? And for PE, you know, getting them to move and they're not, they're sitting down and you're like, hey, Bruce, get up, come on. <laughs> you know, it's great. You can really call them out. So what we realized is, once we finished giving our directions, um, we would start spotlighting some kids as well, right? And they love that because for other kids as well to see, you know, students in their year group being spotlighted, um, they really, really like that. And, you know, that also, that's also helping the individual check-in side of that too. You know, say, so yes, you have a big group, but you've also got that individual check-in, um, which also that brings me to Seesaw, right? We use Seesaw massively and that is great for the individual check-in because with the Wonder Wednesdays, you've got the whole um, grade level there, but on Seesaw, it's by class and, you know, you've got the kids writing to each other, which teachers can monitor, which is great, right? So you can, you can say, I'm not going to allow that comment to come up. Um, but you can, it's very individual on Seesaw. So. Great. Any other ideas for handling large cohorts of teacher, of students? Stephanie, go ahead. Um, our online learning platform that our school has, it's not Google Classroom, but it's similar to that, or Moodle, actually has a box at the bottom of your daily lesson post that says, view who has participated. So if your school has an online learning platform that can do that, that's very helpful because it can show you, oh, that person actually read your post. And I teach middle and high school, so I don't have the same call out, yay, push-ups. Um, although I might try that now. <laughs> um, the other thing I did when I first started, and I've continued to do this, is if I do have a really long, like we're gonna be working on this unit or project or idea for a week or for two weeks or three weeks, I make sure to have, I guess what would be similar to an exit ticket for all of my lesson posts. And it's, it can be, you know, what are you, what are you listening to right now? Post a YouTube video that makes you happy. Um, post a meme of how you're feeling or just, you know, say, say hi. And that those are simple ways that I can say, keep in contact with the kids and say, thank you so much for this meme. It made me laugh. Or I can also just go down my attendance list and say, all right, these people participated in today's class instead of having this big, long thing that they have to do. Fantastic. Oh, go ahead, Jules. Um, so for my school is very small. And um, I, what I tend to do is I create videos and I create lessons and that, that goes out 8.30 on a Monday morning. So it's in, it, then I pop into uh, classes as they 
as, as they run during the week. And I find that that works well because I can reduce two hours of preparing and showing and illustrating into about five minutes of video. Um, kids then have the whole week to look at that project and they can send it. But we also have a specialist Wednesday. So on Wednesday, no other work is given except for music, PE, art. And so that gives the kids a little bit more time to work on it. However, posting it purely on Wednesday means that a lot of kids miss out on Monday and Tuesday. And for my kids, art is a relief. It's a relief from a lot of other things. So, and there are also kids there who will put 10 minutes in on Monday, 10 minutes on Tuesday. So it's important that it's always there so that they can sort of um, go and see it. But that extra time has been given because we found that the specialists, not being the core subjects, uh, suffered a bit, yeah. Fantastic. Um, I want to move us on to question number three. And I see there's a lot of questions going on in the chat. And um, what we'll do is if you ask questions and we haven't had a chance to answer them right now, we will try to follow up. And after the call, we'll be sending out a video of this, but also a link to any resources that have been shared in the chat and Q&A and links to resources from all of our specialists. And we'll try to answer and follow up with any questions. So if your question doesn't get answered right now, um, we're, we're trying to do what we can on the back end. Um, please know we, we are listening and we'll try to do our best to, to do that um, as far as that's concerned. Um, the next question, and Jules, this is specifically kind of for you. Um, but in an online environment, what are some specific strategies that um, that you would suggest using for art specialists? So I found that I am the time for our students when they can um, move away and be creative. So I create these videos. I'm not naturally a theatrical person, but I found myself, you know, dressing up, making wigs, changing clothes, making a lot of props to sort of get that hook to bring kids in um, and making it really interesting. I've also looked at different artists each week introducing. I've almost had to throw out my curriculum because we will go through in one week what would normally take four weeks in the classroom. Um, I do lots of demonstrations and I have my website where I list materials and also objectives. And then I have a lot of com um, contact with parents on email. Does that answer that? Yeah, I have loved watching your videos. <laughs> like they are so much fun. And one of the things that I've noticed is you're being, I think, very vulnerable and theatric and exciting when you, like you're making art just come to life. And like your pop art series has been such a joy. <laughs> um, and so like, I've been like, oh my God, I get to watch another video. Um, so how I, it, I try to make it accessible for also, and I was discussing this with you guys earlier, my friends who have kids. Yeah. Um, and are, we're all stuck at home. So I have people all over running these classes with the kids. And I've looked at kids with very few materials at home and try to work within that, that, those boundaries. Fantastic. Um, and Let's move on to um, PE. And I'm going to post a link to her, her YouTube videos in a second. I posted a link to um, her um, Weebly account, but I'll post a link to the YouTube in just one second. Um, but as we, um, I can't multitask at the moment. Um, so um, in an online environment, I'm going to move us on to question number two, or number four. Um, what are some specific strategies for PE specialists? Carlos and Ishii, do you guys want to take the lead on that? So, you know, we, we realize that when we're even not online, right, even when we're at school, the way we teach is it's very, very student focused. We don't, we, we've moved away from the, you know, stand in the line, 20 sprints, let's go, right? Students aren't responding to that anymore. Um, and so we decided that if we don't do that in the classroom, we're not going to do that or in the gym, we're not gonna do that online either, right? So we're not gonna make a video of us doing a 30 minute circuit and getting the kids to copy us. Instead, we wanted the kids to make that video. Um, so what we did was, you know, we 
told the kids to post a 20 second video of doing any exercise of their choice. You know, it could be star jumps, it could be push-ups. They could get as creative as they wanted as long as they were moving um, for 20 seconds. And, you know, it had to be in a small space so you can't run around the dining table or anything like that, right? And then post it onto Seesaw. And what we did was we just compiled all of that um, and, you know, went around the school getting, getting teachers and staff to just go three, two, one, and that went in between each exercise. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was student created and we called it a student created workout. So they got their fitness workouts, but it wasn't the teacher going, right, this is what you're going to do. Go. It, was, it was made by them for them and they responded really, really well to that. Um, so that's something that we, we loved doing and we were really pleased with, um, with how they responded to that as well. Um, you know, we also, we use Google Sites. Um, we've just started using that now with this online thing because we've realized that, you know, it's, it's so hard for parents and for kids as well when you've got resources everywhere. You know, you've got Seesaw, you've got Zoom links for your Wonder Wednesday, you've got um, YouTube videos and all that. And so with one Google Site, you know, you can put that all there. And what's good about a Google site is when you embed a video, you don't get the ads, right? It doesn't take you to YouTube. It's right there in the Google site. So it's safe, right, for kids. Um, Joe Wicks, by the way, for my PE people out there, um, Joe Wicks is in the UK and he's a personal trainer and he started, you know, he's now known as the nation's PE teacher in the UK. Great, great resource. Um, he does 30 minute circuits pure body weight and so we've started using his videos too fantastic carlos you want to weigh in yeah yeah i think um one of the biggest challenges has been um you know student submissions for me and for the specialists in my school we've been dealing with about 35 maybe 40 percent of, of kids submitting work and so that's been a bit frustrating and a bit challenging for us um, one of the things that I did a couple of uh, weeks ago was I started uh, checking out TikTok dances and um, I realized how many kids are actually on TikTok these days. Now, I didn't do my assignment through TikTok, but I filmed myself doing a choreography and uh, the submissions were insane off the hook and they were coming in right away. I'm assuming some of the kids had already done those choreographies because they were submitting stuff like three minutes in. Um, so now I'm evolving the TikTok dances to them teaching me how to dance. And so now they're sending me slow motion moves about how to do that. Um, but um, jumping on what Ishita said, it, absolutely with Google Sites, I have my own and I created mine uh, maybe four weeks ago. And I don't know if I can share my screen real quick. Um, and I created it because um, parents were telling me that, their, that the assignments uh, on Seesaw, they couldn't find old assignments um, and they didn't have the time to go back and dig. So what I did was I created a little uh, virtual school hub where parents can go and see every single class that I've made. I don't know why this is not transferring through, but I teach with Google Slides, very similar. I'll make a video and then um, you're, able to, you're able to see it. Um, let me see. Well, that's not what we want to see right now. Anyway, um, and then at the bottom, it continues with uh, folders for submissions. So kids know exactly where to submit their work and then a bunch of resources for students to uh, see. And uh, parents were really grateful about having everything in one place. So every week I uh, just keep on uploading all of the assignments that I've done. Um, it's really helped out. It's really helped out a lot. And my other fun tool that I use very often is uh, Flipgrid. Um, it's just a great way to gather all the work in one place and you can download the video submissions and you can keep track of them. Um, those would be my three tools, go-to tools right now. Fantastic. Um, I'm seeing a lot of very specific questions in the chat, which we'll try to get to um, after the, the 
call, uh, or not after the call, after we get through, we want to also talk about music. Um, and we'll also start to address those momentarily as well. But I wanted to make sure that we also um, talk to uh, Stephanie and Nissa about um, in an online environment, what are some specific strategies that you've used for music specialists? Can I jump uh, in for Stephanie? So sure. Know. Awesome. Okay. Um, let me do a, just sort of a big, bigger framing curriculum piece, and then I'll let Stephanie jump into what she's been doing as well. So Stephanie mentioned earlier um, the National Core Art Standards and whether or not you use those standards, I think it can be a really helpful frame. So she talked about uh, create, perform, respond, and connect being the, the big chunks of the National Core Art Standards. And so I think some of the things to ask is, like she was saying, if, you, if perform is often what we do, what could we do instead? What might we emphasize? size, what is uniquely possible at home because kids are home. So if they're living with their family, they could do some interviewing and learning about what is it that their family loves? What music did they grow up with? Why does it matter? Uh, what's important to them? And so they're in actually a unique situation. And so seeing that as from a more strengths-based approach, as opposed to a deficit mentality, I think can be um, helpful uh, with the understanding that there, there are silver linings when a lot of things are really, really difficult. And so as much as we can shift our mindset to that um, can impact our curriculum and our learning as well. And then if you're familiar with the National Core Arts Standards, this actually applies to all arts areas. They have um, with, built in within them process components. So if we ask the question, what is it that musicians or artists do? They create, perform, respond, and connect. And the process components then answer the question, how? How do musicians, in this case, create. And um, for the create process, it outlines four different steps. Um, first, they imagine, then they plan make, then they evaluate, refine, and then they present. And so using that framework for creation can help us in the rollout of lessons. Perhaps the one lesson that you do is all about imagine, and that's, that's what you focus on. And then maybe the next lesson recaps imagine and moves on to the next process component of plan make and so on. So it can help uh, frame how we roll lessons out, but it can also help us chunk them in doable parts. Um, because as folks have been saying, it, we need to make it uh, concise and we need to make it work for them in the context that they're currently in. So those are some framing thoughts about how to approach it. Fantastic. And Stephanie, go ahead. Um, I wanted to address one thing Nissa said about uh, looking for the silver linings and what does this look like now and playing to the strengths of what we have. I was reading a blog post for Choral Clarity the other day and because um, virtual ensembles for music are all over the place now and I've done one that doesn't Good mean you one. should, <laughs> but that also does not mean you should do one. And um, I know for me, I find this to be an opportunity to maybe say, I'm not a choir teacher, I'm a music teacher who teaches vocal music. So do I look at a song playlist uh, or have a karaoke competition? Or um, I know for myself, I have set up for me a schedule of on Mondays, we will learn a new vocal exercise. On Tuesdays, we will listen to a choir. On Wednesdays, I'm just gonna say, hey, are you okay? On Thursdays, we'll do, and, and so each day I have something that pertains to singing that is small, but not necessarily choral singing. Because at this point, um, I think any of us who do this know that a virtual choir is not a choir. Um, a virtual orchestra is not an orchestra. Uh, a virtual basketball team or PE class is not the same. We're not getting the thing that makes it special to us. So I guess my, my biggest advice is what Nissa said, try to find something that works for what you are doing, that is authentic for what you want to do and that can just keep the magic in your specialty because that is why we do what we do because it's magical. Um, so back to like nitty gritty of lessons then, I also have a nine week plan that is on a Google doc that I'm happy to share. And I have shared on Nissa's Facebook page. Um, and yeah, I, I am finding myself the opposite of what Jules said about taking one week or I am now like for what would take me one week takes me four weeks because I don't have the face-to-face -face feedback that I can give kids. And I am also at a 30% submission rate 
And if I do get stuff after that, it's very late. So for me, I have really slowed down anything that I was doing. Because if I try to give the kids five pieces of choral repertoire, ask them to write about it, ask them to learn it, they're not going to do that. They will get overwhelmed very quickly. So for the last nine weeks, I have chosen one big thing to do, and that usually takes two to three weeks. Um, I did just post on Nissa's Facebook page that I had a failure this week. I had a three week project that I spelled out, I wrote the directions, I made a rubric, I put exemplars up, I did everything I thought I could do, and um, it was awful. The submissions I got were terrible. So, uh, and this is one of the beautiful things about being a specialist, I have the choice now to regroup and say, you know what, that was a rough draft. And let's talk about the creative process and why this wasn't good. And let's let's try again. And, or I could have just let it go. No one is actually watching. I don't have to, you know, teach everybody the quadratic equation by week seven or whatever. Um, so that's really nice. But then I get some really great successes. And at this point, especially with my high school students, like what Ishi was talking about, I, this week was like, I don't know what to do now. So I asked them, what should we do now? Here are some suggestions. We could write a song, we could do a research project, and they are now responding to me saying, you know what, this is what I would like to do next. And for high school kids especially, I think that's nice for them because they're like, they, this is hard. And so if they have a choice in what they are doing, they're more likely to do it. I think, um, you guys are really touching upon so many of the things that, I mean, I think never before have our kids needed you guys more. Um, they're spending so much time online and they're worried about all these different exams and worrying about how am I going to keep up? What am I going to do? What if I don't understand a quadratic equation? Whatever, right? And I, I find with three kids of my own, that they are leaning towards the arts more than ever. Um, and they're leaning towards needing physical activity. They're leading towards like, and the hardest part, I think, and I just, I give you guys so much credit, is they don't necessarily have their stuff with them. They may not have the musical instruments. They may not be able to go to the gym or exercise in the same way. They may not have the art, you tend, you know, things that they need. Like my daughter lucked out because she needed to do a watercolor and I happen to have watercolor paper at my house, but you know, but and they happen to have watercolors at my house because I used to be an art major. But most families probably don't have that stuff in their basement. Like, how are you? And you guys are being so creative, just not just in your subject areas, but how you're helping kids still be able to create. Does anyone? I know that wasn't on the questions that I prepped you guys for, but I think that's an important one because I see it in the side where people are saying, "Well, my kids don't have anything at home to work with." How are you addressing some of those things? Anyone want to talk about that? Go ahead, Ishi. Um, you know, so for PE, we really said that we want to take this opportunity to, to really teach our kids the skills to stay active if they can't go out and if they can't get the equipment, right? And so especially elementary now, you know, YouTube, you can go look at your fun videos, but you can also get workouts there where you don't need equipment, right? And when we do Wonder Wednesdays, our art teacher, um, you know, she's great. She teaches kids how to, how to create art without needing any fancy watercolors or anything, you know? I mean, today in our Wonder Wednesday, she, she drew different types of lines and said, what, what different types of um, images or pictures can you make with these different types of lines, right? And I think what we're really what we're really trying to teach our kids right now is really valuable life skills. You know, that, that when, you don't, when you don't have the resources that you're used to, how do you still maintain your level of physical activity, your creative side with what you've got, right? And it's just allowing them to get as creative as possible. Um, you know, and that's why, at least for us with PE, you know, we're, we're not assigning any assignments, really. You know, we're saying these are your options. Um, you know, this is what you can do. And by getting the kids to send, um, send through their activities too, you know, other kids are like, oh, Tyler 
Tyler did this today. Maybe I can try that out too, right? And so they're just feeding off each other as well. But it really does. It builds resilience. It, it makes them creative. Jules, go ahead. So when we started our program, we the, I hadn't seen the kids. It was Chinese New Year. So I couldn't send materials home with the kids. So our first project was drawing the interior. I assume that they have paper and a pencil. And most families now have some markers or colour pencils and watercolours. So we work with those. Um, but I also took them outside and looked at Andy, at Andy Goldsworthy. So I walked down to the beach here and I created sculptures outside. So I, I try and work with what we have. Like I upcycle cardboard boxes and and I, I've looked on YouTube as well because you know we, we're all looking for new ideas at this time. And um, a lot of people have some great ideas out there how to utilize what's around the house. There's people making paints from coffee and you know using all sorts of different things. And I think that we, we need to see this as a positive thing, you know, and we need to give uh, you know kids sort of ownership of their own learning and that they can find things at home that will work and always offer well at least for me i offer classes that everyone can engage in and sometimes i differentiate so that some kids who are really artistic and who have a box of acrylics at home can push themselves further i've even had like uh, stop motion you know some kids that are really into stop motion can use that but other kids can make a flip book from materials around the house i think you have to be not only aware of what materials they have or have not got but also the fact that families are stressed and we really don't want to add to that stress. We want to, you know, give some reprieve from that stress. So we don't want parents running around feeling like they have to go and buy these things and, or have to sit with their kids for the lessons, you know? So I've tried to, I know with my videos, create self-explanatory videos that kids could watch and actually do something with, you know? Fantastic. And that kind of brings us, oh, uh, I'm going to go to Carlos next and then we'll go up. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to, to make a quick uh, comment. I think that um, everybody in the world right now is stressed out. Everybody doesn't know what tomorrow will look like. So think about how our, student, our, our children and our students are feeling, except they feel helplessness on top of that. So we as specialists, this is our time to shine um, uh, by, by making sure that we're not an extra pressure on them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to move us along into, because um, we'll have more time also at the end, but as specialists, um, are there any specific recommended platforms or tools or digital resources that you have found that have been really helpful as a specialist. Um, Carlos, did you want to start us off with that question? Uh, yeah, um, I, I just wanted to, to show a little bit about Flipgrid really and the way that it works. Um, it's super easy uh, to, to make and to uh, create your videos with it. Uh, let me find my, um, so this would be, I think I sent this assignment a couple of weeks ago. It was a junk food and calories uh assignment uh, you can uh create your own little video at the beginning i always make a goofy face because the kids like it uh and i post the questions uh that i want them to address in their videos and and then they start submitting and the kids uh the cool thing about it is that you can then get their the the students to come in you can play uh what they submitted it they can submit by text or they can also submit by voice See if I can find one with a voice. Um, Hi, and welcome to my calorie and workout reflection. Today I'm going to answer some junk food questions. So uh, this was off of my nutrition unit. And the cool thing is that I can then uh, grade her and send her a number depending on what I thought about how she did. I can send her feedback from here directly, or I can even video feedback back to her. And so the kids are feeling completely engaged uh, with their teacher. And, you know, for me, I am not one who has, who likes to check 10 different places to look for, for student work. So this is a good place for me as a PE teacher to, um, 
to see all the work that's turned in. And uh, you can just share uh, QR codes. And once the students scan the QR code, they go straight into the grid and they can start videotaping right away. Nice. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add a couple of resources or ideas? Stephanie, go ahead. Honestly, Facebook. <laughs> um, be, and, and that's one of the wonderful things about this. And we were talking about this earlier is I have actually had more conversations with other music teachers in the last two months than I think in the last 10 years of teaching because there are so many groups now um, that you can find something really specific to what you're looking for. And additionally, there are so many, at least for music, uh, companies out there who have put their stuff out there for free. I heard that Logic and um, uh, Final Cut Pro are available for a free trial for teachers right now, or The Shed, or Music First, or all of these other places um, that are like, please try our stuff out. This is a hard time for all of us. And I know I'm part of Nissa's really awesome Facebook group. And through that, I get private messages or I, I say, look, I want to do this thing and I have no idea how to do it. And there's usually somebody who is like, I've already had done this and this is how you do it. Here's a video I made. So to me right now, Facebook has been my most invaluable resource. Fantastic. Nessa? I just want to jump in too and say that one of the greatest ironies and gifts, I think, of all the conversations that I've had with everybody uh, from, from a music teacher standpoint is that it's not always the music specific apps that are helping us actually. People are finding, and I think this is a, a, an important priority, is to use the platform that your school supports because you're kids know how to use it. You can get tech support if you if you have questions about it. So start with what you have, I think, first of all. And when we're talking about, you know, using, uh, doing a lot of responding, which has come up a lot in the ideas that we've had, you know, put together a playlist, find out what music matters to your family. Those are all respond things. And so I've seen people you do amazing things things, say like on Padlet. It's not music specific, but it doesn't have to be because we're talking about responding. So I think we can get into wanting a lot of fancy, cool apps. And I think it's important to use what you have first and figure out what your goal is and then find the technology that matches that. And it might not be what you thought when you started. When I first started playing around with technology, someone told me to try to be the master of a few instead of all. And like you get a couple, you get them under your belt, you feel comfortable there, and then you can start to explore some other things. And I think that really helps is you've got to figure out where your comfort zone is and what you feel comfortable with. Some people feel really comfortable on video. Other people are like, oh, good God, that's like the last thing I want to do. But And so like just trying to figure out what that is and then make that work. And I think that's really important advice. Um, that brings us to um, the last question before we open it up to the Q&A. And I just wanted to talk about, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but how might we harness the different content areas for all our special, uh, for specialists um, to help promote student well-being? Um, that it's so important for our students to walk away from screens and to be cognizant of all, I mean, there's just so much going on in the world right now, and we feel it as adults, our students are definitely feeling it. Um, Nissa, did you want to start us off with that question? Sure. I think it really builds on what we were talking about earlier of making use of what we have. And I think one of the hardest things about our time, even pre-home uh, learning or pre-pandemic, is everyone's so busy. And we've, we've, we've gotten lost in the, in the world of busyness. And one of the things, a specific thing I wanted to mention, I think that one of the things that um, movement and the arts do um, is they put our brain in a different state and they allow us to be present in a different way. And so even before this, we needed to figure out ways to be mindful and to be in the moment. But now we need that for different reasons um, exponentially. And I wanted to give a shout out to Christy Wanamaker from Shanghai American School. I, um, I talked with her yesterday and we did a 10 minute masterclass with, which are like mini masterclasses in the e-learning and music education Facebook group. And she was going through the create process like I outlined earlier. And her imagine was um, a, a child sitting around the dinner table with a family and they were actually making music with just the things they had at the dining room table. And she recovered 
how it recorded like a soundscape. And that was the like the jumping off point of the composition. And I love that for so many reasons because she was in that moment connecting with her family and making music together, being playful and joyful. And the laughter was absolutely contagious. It was so beautiful. So I think finding ways that our art form can put us in a flow state um, or our movement can bring us into the present moment um, and we can find ways to connect through our arts. I think that's just really powerful and, and so possible in a way that um, is so uh, present to us right now. We have this opportunity and I would argue responsibility right now to make that the focus of our learning for students, not some of the academic stuff that we can do next school year. We'll get to that, but what can transform our kids right now um, and I, I think that's the most important thing we can bring. Fantastic. Um, I'm, oh, go ahead, Jules. Did you want to say something? No, no, okay. but I also, I, but actually, can I add, I think it's also important to look at our own mental health. Um, I've taken up sketchbooking as a teacher. Um, so, so I go to a class on Mondays and now it's virtual, but I do it because I was finding this tough as well, you know, because when we're presenting and when we're putting all this work into our videos, we're being very happy and we're, we are really trying to be encouraging, but you know, we're all feeling the stress. So we really need to look after ourselves and work out a way to do that. If that's going for a run or a dance in your bedroom or, at, you know, starting up a sketchbook or writing down in a journal, I think that we need to prioritize that. I just muted myself by accident. I wanted to turn it over to uh, Laura Benson, uh, who's going to help us um, work through some of the questions that have been coming in through the Q&A. She and John have been monitoring that. So Laura, I'm get, I'd like to turn it over to you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, uh, panelists, we have a lot of questions um, around managing time and uh, including adjusting schedules. I know you guys have addressed this really beautifully, but just to maybe deepen your thinking about fulfilling administrative responsibilities or requirements, just dealing with time and the idea of with that time, sometimes you're capturing a lot of your kids. And Stephanie, as you were saying, sometimes we aren't. And, and that's just the reality of this, absolutely. But maybe if uh, you have some pearls and thoughts and uh, support for um, our participants around the issue of time. Go ahead. Um, so I'm also the mother of two pre-K pre children. So the time management thing really hits home to me because I also have two seesaws that I'm supposed to be managing as well as my middle and high school classes. Yes. And um, I think one of the things you need to do is figure out what kind of person you are. I love schedules and lists. So I will make those and I will set very specific limits for myself. If I, like we have report cards coming up and I'm going to say, okay, I will work on my report cards for one hour today. And then I'm gonna close my computer. And it's kind of like those blogs that tell you schedule your workouts so that you'll do them. Same thing, schedule your life. You need to say, I, I'm going to work for an hour today and then I'm going to close my computer and go for a walk or I'm going to work for an hour and then I'm going to go bake some bread or whatever you need to do to get away from your screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you're doing your time management, you also need to understand, I think, that being in front of a computer is far more exhausting than being in front of kids. So while at the end of the day of actual teaching, you'll feel like tired, but yay, that was a fun day after a couple hours just staring at your computer, you feel awful. So really making sure you set strict limits for yourself on how much time you are actually spending on your work, regardless of what people who might pay you say. Smart, wise, thank you. Anyone else? Hello, Carlos. Yeah, um, for us, uh, when we first started um, nine weeks ago, Right. We were advised as specialists to try to engage the kids in the amount of time that you would have seen them that week. So if, if grade five B was gonna come in for two 35 minute blocks, to try to engage them in that way. Of course, if it's a workout, then that counts as that time too. 
Um, we began with that, but then we did realize that that was a struggle to just make sure that it was happening. Um, so what we do as specialists at our school is that Monday morning or m Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning, right. we fire away one assignment for the week. Perfect. I love that. I think that's so brilliant. Anyone else? I just wanted to say that if you're about to start, know that it will take twice as long. Right. Regular classes to start with. And, you know, Stephanie, that's a great point. You really have to be very strict with yourself and protective of yourself. But it, I can tell you, everybody I know is working <laughs> twice as hard. Right. So just to be aware of that to start with, and that's not going to be unusual until you sort of get used to how everything's running. But you still put, if you, yes, it, it takes a long time. Yeah, I've heard a rule of thumb is plan your week, half it, and then half it again. You know, it's, it's just, uh, as many of you all said, it's just a different time equation. The math is different. Hey, another question we're getting from our um, incredible participants here is around parent communication and parent expectations. Um, you know, there's the idea of following through, um, get, gaining their support, or just explaining um, or sharing yeah, your vision um, for this new reality that we're in. But anything about parent communication and parent connections? Um, I have a lot of parents write to me and they send photos of their kids working. Um, I, and I, I respond to the parents and make sure that, because I think the parents are also struggling and it's nice to have that connection with any teacher, be it the art teacher, the PE teacher, the classroom teacher. Yeah. Um, I have about 25% of my kids submit work. So we've got to be realistic about Absolutely. what they can actually do as well, right? You know, I think that's very wise. Carlos? Yeah, um, one thing that we do is that we try not to get back and forth with parent emails. We try to let admin take care of that. And we try to send at least two wellness surveys every week to parents and students and teachers as well to gauge what's going on. Um, for the first seven weeks of virtual school, um, kids could, you know, uh, here in Vietnam, we're very lucky that the situation is quite contained. Uh, we are working from home now, but uh, our teachers could still make packets that kids could come and pick up. One of the things we realized is that our parents, they didn't learn virtually. They learned by doing worksheets. So they found it a lot easier to be able to go to school, pick up the books, pick up worksheets, pick up stuff and then bring it back. Um, but now that we're working at home, we're gonna have the challenge that that's probably not gonna happen after spring break this week. Um, right. So it's a lot of evolution that's happening and a lot of decisions are being made to address what's happening at the end of the day, every day. Gotcha. Well, and I think your thoughtful ideas and we're having a lot of participants offer ideas about, you know, using things in the home and, uh, you know, just developing those habits of, uh, you know, creativity and physical activity, as you all mentioned. Um, maybe one last uh, question, uh, kind of synthesizing questions from participants uh, with a little bit of our remaining time here um, is around uh, inclusion and uh, supporting students with learning differences. Jules, thank you. Sorry, uh, I mean, art just lends itself to yeah. kids of all abilities. So I have, encourage kids if they really don't want to follow what's going on because they don't always to create and to send me whatever they're doing and they do and and, and it's also not necessarily um at the time when i'm setting uh, units as well so i think there has to be flexibility and there has to be you know you you celebrate that right and I think your individual check-ins and just all the thoughtfulness you all describe is, is a way that you're doing that. Stephanie. Um, I, th I, I feel for maybe most of us here that uh, English language learning is probably one of the biggest things we face as, as inclusion. And my advice would be to, if you're going to give directions, give it in as many ways as possible. Yeah. Um, something yeah. I, like, I, I actually really hate making videos for my classes, but I do it because one, I know the kids miss seeing a face, but some kids might 
like when they hear or see me give directions, they will be able to get that. But then I also make sure to type them out in at least two places so that people who take longer to hear the English language will be able to at least read and go back. Um, and then there's always the, the checking in. And I think this is also where it's one, important to make sure the kids know that if they can't do something, it's really important that they say, hey, I need help, yeah. or I need a little more time, or this is where, <laughs> and with specialists, we usually have a pretty good relationship, that yeah. they, they might need more time, and they should be able to come to you and say, I need more time, and you can say, okay, or I don't understand what this means, or I don't, all, all of these things. So, being very clear in multiple ways and then also being as flexible as possible with your expectations and even the content that you are offering. I know Nissa talks about concept-based learning when she gives a lot of her workshops and this again is a great time to say instead of looking at watercolor or the major scale, can we explore a concept where you're not actually limited by the skill or resource and that will serve more children? Yeah, I think you're, you're, you all have such thoughtful habits of encouraging students' self-evaluation and, and gaining that feedback and really building your uh, teaching upon that feedback. And just that whole um, thoughtful thrust from each of you around building student metacognition. And, and as you say, Stephanie, making it okay to say, I'm not sure, you know, to reach out and, and understand that what they may see as a mistake, you know, it, a big part of it, I think our jobs is helping kids understand those are just, that's just part of learning. So I'm gonna throw it back to Dana now. Um, we're just about ready to wrap up and I just can't thank you guys all enough for A, um, participating and volunteering to be in a webinar with um, so many people and also um, for all our participants for asking such thoughtful questions, um, both in the Q&A and in the chat. And we will um, do our best to answer as many of those as we can um, and then send out the links after the call. Um, I. In this all started a couple weeks ago when things started to look like it was going to just spread across the world. And I put out a call to um, international teachers that I knew seeing would any of you be willing to mentor just one other teacher. Um, we had um, about 200 um, educators, international educators say, yes, I'd take somebody, but we had um, the amount of teachers who needed help was in the thousands and we couldn't give like poor Carlos, like if I was to give Carlos, you know, like, oh, here's just 2000 teachers who need a mentor. Like that would be a little too much for anyone, especially because we're teaching our own teachers, our own students. So I really, uh, the webinars are a way for us to try to pull people together. And next week we're going to have one on, um, secondary counselors and to talk about what how do we do um, you know things that are um, perhaps um, uh, really hitting our secondary students especially when we're talking about virtual graduation not being able to say goodbye closure um, and um, how these kids um, are going to go through missing some of those major things that happen in your lifetime um, and what schools are thinking about and then the week after that we're having one um, same time same place um, on assessment and we have Ken O'Connor and um, I believe five other panelists um, who are amazing with assessment who are going to come and join us and talk about what does assessment look like online. So we're gonna keep trying to bring these to you as much as we can. Um, we're listening to your ideas um, and ways that we can continue to make this happen and bring teachers together. Thank you very much everybody um, for all of your work today. And we will be sending out a link to the chat, a link to the video, a link to all the resources, anything we can find and any way we can help. And if you have suggestions on ways we can continue to help, please feel free to let us know. But from everyone at ISS and all our panelists, thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate it. Bye. Bye.